All right. So hello, everybody, and welcome to this JavaScript state of frameworks. We do the state of frameworks uh, once every six months or so. So thank you so much for joining. Um, it's quite uh, an honor to have so many amazing people from different frameworks and libraries coming to uh, speak with us. I wanted to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Tracy. You can find me on Twitter at Lady Leap. I'm one of the co-founders of this dot. I'm also on the RxJS core team and do community relations for Node and a bunch of other exciting things. So uh, today we have Evan Yu, who's going to give us a state of Vue. We also have Minko Gachev, who is going to give us a state of Angular. Michael Dawson, who is going to give us a state of Node. Jen Weber, who is going to give us a state of Ember. Uh, Manu, um, I'm not going to butcher your last name who's going to give us a state of stencil, and also Marvin, who's going to give us a state of Preact. Now, we know React is missing. Unfortunately, uh, the person that was going to give us an update on React had to reschedule last minute. But, um, you know, there's always Twitter. So <laughs> check that out. <clears throat> uh, we have a few upcoming online events as well. So uh, we just started doing these framework, specific, framework slash library specific events. So every first Thursday, you can join us for our global Angular meetup online. Every second Thursday, we have uh, our global React meetup online. And then every third Thursday, we have uh, Vue online. So the next one is August 15th this week. And then we have Web Components online uh, every fourth Thursday. And the first one is going to be August 22nd as well. These events are basically two speakers at each event. So they're about an hour each, um, but a really great way to make content more accessible. So our goal is that more speakers within the communities who can't travel can speak and also more folks who don't have a really strong uh, you know, meetups in their area can actually attend as well. They're also always recorded, so you'll always be able to see them online. Uh, and then we have Modern Web Online September 3rd. So I wanted to quickly thank my company, This.Labs. We do JavaScript consulting. Uh, so if anybody's interested or excited, we work everywhere from small two-person shops to uh, larger 300-person organizations, engineering organizations. Uh, and we do everything from Angular, Vue, React, GraphQL a lot these days, uh, Node, et cetera. So it's always fun and my email inbox is always open. So that being said, uh, I wanted to go ahead and quickly introduce Evan. Uh, Evan is the creator of Vue.js and he's going to give us a quick update on Vue. So Evan, I'll let you go ahead and get your screen share set up over there. And if anybody has any questions for Evan, you can feel free to add it into the chat right over here uh, to, the, to your right side. And uh, if anybody has any questions or anything, you can also private message me if, uh, if you need anything. So thanks, Evan, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, can, there, can everyone see the screen sharing? Yes, we can. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, so here's an update for uh, Vue. I know a lot of Vue users have been um, waiting for the 3.0 release, um, and we've been hard at work, but 3.0 is uh, has to be postponed due to some major design updates. Um, but it's going to be released later than we hoped. But um, hopefully the, uh, these major design updates are going to be worth it. So this is going to be just quickly going through what these updates really are. So first is a new template compilation strategy. Uh, a, lot of us, a lot of our users know that uh, Vue, is, um, Vue uses templates. A lot of users use templates, but we also compile templates into virtual DOM render functions. So we actually have templates on top and virtual DOM underneath, uh, but some of the performance costs uh, when it comes to updating your application comes from the bottleneck of a traditional virtual DOM implementation in the sense that even if your template contains only a small dynamic uh, node, uh, the virtual DOM different algorithm still has to walk through the whole virtual DOM tree to find out what exactly has changed. Uh, Rich Harris has talked about this in his, um, his talk as well. And actually one of the inspirations was because Svelte uh, is able to do some really smart uh, template-based compilation to generate extremely efficient update code uh, for templates. 
So um, Vue is uh, combined with Vue's reactivity system, we are able to do pretty precise tracking at the component tree level, but we still do a full virtual down diff for every component when it updates. So we want to try to see if we can uh, improve this in component update for each template. And the, the bottleneck really comes from the, the usage of a, of a virtual DOM, right? Uh, Svelte completely foregoes the virtual DOM, allows it to generate more efficient code. So why does Vue keep using the virtual DOM? So first and foremost, um, our 2.x uses virtual DOM. We have a lot of libraries and user land implementations using virtual DOM because virtual DOM gives you full expressiveness of JavaScript when needed, right? This is what a lot of people a lot of React users love about JSX or render functions is because it gives you uh, the full power of the language itself. Uh, it also gives us more succinct generated code compared to uh, imperative instructions uh, generated by Svelte. So basically, we have to keep the virtual DOM. So we need to find a, a way where we still allow people using virtual DOM, but um, we also want to improve the update performance by leveraging all these static information available in the templates, right? The hard thing about optimizing raw render functions or JSX is because it's so dynamic. It's pretty much just JavaScript. Uh, so there are a lot of assumptions that is not safe to make compared to templates. Whereas templates being a more constraining language, uh, it, gives, uh, it places more constraints on what you can actually write or express, but at the same time, uh, this constraint, these constraints actually uh, becomes useful information when it comes to optimizing the output. So a simple case we can see here is this template, there's only a single node that may change. So we're only, we're only going to uh, the ideal output, the result, end result is when the message changes, we only want to diff that single text node and do nothing else. Um, and for this part, uh, it becomes a bit more complicated when there is a if, which is a conditional branch in, in the template. So a conditional branch will cause the tree structure, the node structure of the tree to change. So this is where uh, why virtual DOM has to do a full diff uh, to figure out how nodes have changed or moved. But if we separate these blocks uh, into two blocks, one is the outer block, one is the inner block, uh, so we treat the VIF node as a node itself. And we can see in the outer block, the whole tree structure is stable. And inside the if block, the tree structure is also stable. So when we separate blocks this way, similarly for V4, we can do the same thing. So when we separate blocks this way, we actually create uh, a, a number of blocks, each with complete static inner structure. So this allows us to skip uh, the, this uh, tree list diffin. Uh, the skip diffing for any potential node changes inside these blocks, within each of these blocks. So we divide a huge template into a number of blocks. And each, inside each block, because node structure is completely stable, the only thing we need to care about is a, one single flat array of dynamic nodes, uh, nodes with um, text changes or uh, value bindings. Uh, so this greatly reduces the total amount of work needed when we try to diff two virtual DOM trees. Uh, so this is before, right? To, to update this single message, we had to go through this whole diffing algorithm on the right, but after the optimization, uh, we only just diff that single node uh, because at the root of the template, we actually store a flat array of, of potential dynamic nodes for this particular template. So with the new strategy, the, the big idea is update performance is now determined by how many dynamic nodes there are in your template versus how big your template is. Um, so this actually uh, improves runtime performance by quite a bit. Uh, we did a very rough performance benchmark for our prototypes. Um, a list with 1,000 items. Each item has a bunch of DOM nodes, a bunch of dynamic bindings, just pretty uh, standard content that you'd see in a typical app. And we will update all the dynamic bindings, take average of 100 runs, and we see uh, Views Current 2.6 takes 36 milliseconds per run, and the prototype shows a 5.4 milliseconds per run. So that's like up to, four, uh, up to six times faster uh, in terms of runtime update performance. So 
that's um, the new template strategy. And another aspect is uh, how components are defined, right? So previously we had an RFC about the class API uh, using classes to author view components, and that's been canceled with the primary reason being um, the class API was originally proposed for better TypeScript support, which is one of the major goals of 3.0. But uh, after a bunch of iterations and research, we found that um, Vue's current design is just, it just doesn't play really well with the idea of, of a class where everything needs to be exposed on this, right? So um, we declare, so Vue components declare a lot of props or dependency injection properties using options. But these options somehow needs to allow TypeScript to infer what properties they, it needs to inject onto this. So it just create, creates a lot of um, edge cases or difficulties when it comes to type, uh, perfect type inference. So the only way to kind of get around that is using decorators. But as we all know, decorators have been, the proposal itself has been going through a lot of, um, I would say, interesting iterations and overhauls. And it's just a really, too unstable for us to build a whole new API on top of it at this point. So um, aside from that, we noticed that uh, the class API doesn't really offer that much on top of our existing API. So uh, if it doesn't improve TypeScript, TypeScript support, but and at the same time doesn't offer much on top of our existing API, we should probably just not do it. So um, we then came up with an RFC for the function-based API. Uh, Vue users are probably aware of this. It, this caused a bunch of controversies uh, because our original messaging regarding how this could potentially deprecate our 2.x API, which we have um, listened to the community feedback and decided that this is that we're not going to deprecate anything. This is just going to be a purely additive API. And uh, we're considering renaming it to Composition API to better express what purpose this new API is meant to um, what, what problems this new API is meant to address. So uh, high level idea is we want to allow, uh, provide a set of APIs that allow users to um, solve uh, code organization and logic reuse in large complex components. Um, so the first step is uh, we have some primitive APIs like just creating some reactive state or um, watching that reactive state and applying side effects, or uh, creating computed values on top of reactive uh, derived state from source-based reactive states. So with these primitive APIs, we can put them together into the component with a new component option called setup. So this is the function where you can declare a bunch of reactive state and then return it, which then becomes available to be used inside the template. So um, this does not affect templates, syntax, or the single file component format. It only affects how the component is defined in JavaScript. Um, it's also uh, additive in the sense that this can be used alongside ex existing 2.x API. So it doesn't really replace it. Uh, it can be used uh, as a um, additional feature for advanced use cases where this is really needed. Um, the primary benefits is this allows you to organize code by, uh, by feature instead of by options. So this, is, uh, this benefit is really similar to how React Hooks kind of uh, addresses some of the problem of the class-based API in React. Uh, and this whole composition API is also heavily inspired by React Hooks. Um, so with the options API, a huge component often has very fragmented logic. The same logical concern would be split uh, into fragments uh, and scattered across the template, uh, across multiple options blocks. But with the composition API, each logical concern is co-located in a single function, which makes it much easier to um, track down and understand, uh, especially if you're reading code not written by yourself. So inside the setup function, you can sort of clearly see what the component is trying to do and then trace back the logic. Uh, it also makes reusing logic between components a lot easier. Uh, this is an example to trying to track mouse position. Uh, previously, this would involve a data options, a method, and two lifecycle hooks, where in here, everything is just contained in a single function and can be very cleanly reused uh, across components. 
So um, some of these logical reviews can also be achieved using existing patterns like mixins, higher order components, or uh, renderless functions for your scope slots. But each of those patterns more or less have their own problems and using function composition, it kind of addresses all of those uh, because function composition has no namespace clashing, shows clear property sources, and it doesn't cost extra component instances. It's just for logic reuse. So um, this game API also happens to just completely solve the type inference problem because functions and variables, TypeScript already, already does a really good job at inferring types for that. So um, with proper internal typing, uh, a lot of generics, um, we can provide a really really nice out of box type, type experience. And the best part is um, code, TypeScript code using the new API looks almost exactly like playing ES because there's very, very little type hints needed. So um, this also potentially means even plain JavaScript code can benefit from internal typings when it comes to IDE support. So overall, this is um, what we're planning to do for V3. And um, there is an existing RFC on our, uh, in our RFC repo, but it's a bit outdated. We're actually working on a major revision to better uh, convey the idea behind this whole proposal. So uh, keep an eye on it. And that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always awesome to kind of take a step back and reflect on, you know, new stuff that's happening within the communities and you guys are doing amazing. So awesome. Um, so next up, we're going to go and feel free to ask Evan questions in the chat window if you like. But next up, we're going to go ahead and introduce Jen Weber, who is on the Ember team. So Jen, you can go ahead and take it away from here. Great, thank you. Give me one second to share my slides. All right. Can everyone see that all right? Yep, perfect. All right, great. Um, so thanks, everyone. I'm super excited to tell you a little bit about some of the latest things going on in Ember, primarily something called Ember Octane um, and the idea of addition. So I'll cover um, what additions are um, why we have something called Octane, uh, and then give a very brief tour of some of the features that I'm most excited to see. All right, so, um, so additions are what we've come up with as a way to help companies go through big migrations. So, you know, as we learn new things about JavaScript's uh, developers' needs, um, things like the programming models that we provide for them can change over time. But at the same time, we don't want to cause huge disruptions to companies who need their apps to be stable and be backwards compatible and not have to confront big changes all at once. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about additions um, and kind of how we see it, how we are approaching the versioning. and. Uh, if this sounds interesting to anyone, is something you want to try with the libraries you're working on, whether it's a framework or others, um, people from the Ember community would be happy to go over this with you, some of the challenges um, and benefits that we've run into. Um, so in addition, represents a cohesive programming model. model. So uh, an addition is the name for a collection of features, if we're going to say it in like a very plain way. Basically, uh, over the past year or so, even longer really, Ember has been slowly introducing new features that provide kind of a new way to build apps. Um, it has different file system options available. It has better support for native classes, things like that. Um, and what that means is that how an Ember app looks after we release Octane um, it looks very different than the Ember apps of the past. But if someone doesn't want to adopt those new patterns right away, they can continue to get backwards compatible updates. So I say like it's a, Octane is something that's happening in a minor release. It's non-breaking changes, but it's the kind of um, big news and big thing that we would have in the past associated with a major release. Um, so, uh, since we're making so many changes, 
um, we want to provide our users with lots of extra support. So um, for Octane, since there are big syntax changes and some new APIs, we want to provide code mod support that helps them easily migrate large code bases. Um, as well as we provide support in the form of linting, as well as really just getting hands-on and doing community Q&A. Um, so Octane is coming in version 3.14 of Ember is our current plan. Um, if there's changes to that, we'll make some updates. And uh, right now we're on um, 3.12 which is going to be a long-term support. So we're about two releases away from uh, providing this new experience for building Ember apps. Um, now let's share a little bit about some of the features that I'm most excited about in Octane. So the first one is that um, when, once it, I guess this is something that's still the same. I'm excited that it still basically looks like HTML in the templates. One thing that's really important to me, as well as a lot of other people in the community, is that we provide ways for people who are CSS and HTML specialists to be able to work easily within our templates and have some familiarity um, when they arrive. So uh, kind of making sure that uh, we are providing a good experience for them as well as for, you know, your more uh, JavaScript focused developer. Um, the next thing I want to share that's a really awesome feature is something called tracked. So in the past, um, if you, let's say you have a component, you have its template and its JavaScript file, you make a change to um, a property of the components, like, you know, say you change um, a counter's value to go up by one or something like that. Um, in some way, you have to tell the framework, hey, I'm going to, you know, watch this property for updates and then display the new value. Um, in Octane, we are introducing something called tracked, where instead of telling a computed field, to watch certain other properties for updates, you just apply a label to the keys that need to be watched. So I'll give an example here. Um, this is a feature called tracked. So in this example, um, we're saying that tracked, we want to track what the value of item is, and then we can write a regular um, native class getter that returns that incremented value. Um, this is pretty powerful when you start talking about big, complicated apps. You know, you might be tracking lots of different state across the app and having to label which things a function needs to watch was often a source of confusion. You couldn't look at the JavaScript and know, okay, if I change this thing, it's going to have all these downstream effects. Now that it's labeled, you can look at it and say, okay, this is tracked. Other things are relying on the value of this property. So um, we're really excited about this uh, pattern. You can see here we are using decorators. It's something that um, we're committed to supporting if you know, decorators continue to change over time. Um, we think that uh, working with native classes gives a lot of powerful options to people who are already familiar with these patterns in regular JavaScript. So um, that's something we're excited about. Um, if you want to learn more about what's going on with Ember Octane, we have a section on our website, emberjs.com slash additions. And um, there's also a roadmap that goes over some of the things that we're looking forward to over the next year. In the very near term, we're focused very strongly on Octane and updating all of our teaching materials and resources to reflect kind of this new way to do things. Um, but we are really looking forward in uh, 2019 through 2020 to work on, uh, continue working on performance, usability, uh, and accessibility. So um, my name is Jen Weber. I'm an engineer at Cardstack. You can reach out to me if you have any questions. And um, thanks for listening. And thanks to Melanie Sumner, who helped make these beautiful slides. Thank you so much.
I do love the Tom Stir and I do love Melanie and you and Ember. So <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Tracy. For <laughs> thanks for presenting. Yeah, it's like all the cool things all wrapped into one. Um, and it's really nice to see Ember really like taking sort of a enterprise approach and helping companies with large migrations. I love to see that focus. Yeah, on. that's something we're really excited about. Yeah. Cool, awesome. So um, Marvin is next. Marvin is on the Preact 14. And uh, Marvin, I'll let you take it over. Thank you so much. Ooh. So let me check. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Perfect. So um, as you said, I'm working for the Preact team. And this is a, a way to give you a quick update on what we've been up to in the past month. Um, the big news is obviously Project X. We revealed this on this very panel. I think it was last November. I think it's wow, it's been close to a year now. And during that time, we had uh, we're not out yet, but we had lots of releases. Like we had um, nine releases. Um, as you can see, we went from the alpha phase into a beta phase, and are now close uh, before our release. We just released our first and second RC. So um, it should come out soon, but it's hard to say a definite date. But it's not just project we are working on. Um, if you're wondering uh, what these names are, these are uh, our release names. We always have like a challenge who comes up with the most hilarious release name. So yeah, it's a bit like a fun story for us. Um, it's of course the difficult part is the last part. I always talk about like when you're working on the project and doing a release, you have like the first 90% and the last 90% you have to do. And we're, right now, we didn't want to release Preact X um, without any documentation, without having uh, the tooling up to date. So we're, we're trying to, to make sure that everything is ready once Preact X goes gold. We started with upgrading the documentation. Is this something um, that we can cross off? Because we just launched our new sites. It has some, um, we're, we're adding a little more polish uh, now that it's live, but it's, you can actually go and, on the site and check out the new documentation. It's not just a new facelift. It's also like it has received tons of updates content-wise. Um, there's new new docs about hooks, new docs about context, about web components, how you can upgrade from an existing Project 8 installation, and all that stuff you kind of wanted to have in a doc. Now we've spent, I think it took us like one and a half months to really get it in shape. It was kind of a neat way for us to dog food our own, um, our own library because this site is built with Preact X and um, it uses the latest CLI, the latest browser, the latest everything. So we're kind of um, using it to test bed our, our own code, which is really great and makes sure that everybody has a smooth upgrade experience. Um, the documentation is done, so we can basically cross it off our list. And the next thing is obviously when you try out a new library is the tooling. If you're using React, you probably heard of Create React App and the Preact CLI is a similar tool um, that can be used to to kickstart your application in in Project. And the cool thing is, um, it's the third version is right around the corner. We have um, we've made sure that it works with both um, Preact 8, which is the current stable version, and the next one, which will be Preact 10. And it spots quite an amazing uh, new set of features. It's not just like a dependency upgrade. It also spots like um, you can do. Um, it's it's similar to. Uh, in some ways to Next.js because it has some, some uh, similarities like automatic route splitting. And this time we also made sure that we're splitting the CSS correctly so that you're not loading CSS on your initial route incorrectly, which would be just bloat. And also another feature that we have is um, we've built a new testing preset because always people kept asking us like, how do I test Preact with, um, with anything. And so we made sure that um, we have a new preset. It can be used right now. You can just install it and we'll set up all aliasing and uh, all the JSX stuff and mock CSS modules and all that stuff that you can start using um, Jest and Preact together right now, which is easy because it's just a single line and you can just ready to go, which is quite neat. So um, we with all these things, we're trying to make sure that the, that the development experience is much better than it was previously. And um, so the tooling is close to done. I'd say it will be probably released this month. I'm hoping it's this month. There isn't any, uh, like, is it, there's one ticket left we have to do for the CLI to go out the door, but we're, we're close, so it should come out soon. 
But obviously, we cannot just talk about tooling. We have to talk about Preact itself. Um, we have to actually do the release. And um, since, like we last talked about Preact, we had lots of changes. Like again, we are spending more time on developer tooling. We implemented lots of debug warnings, which um, warn you when you pass something incorrect into a DOM, pass or into the JSX constructions, like an empty object or anything so that you can easier find these errors. Also, like HTML nesting errors, which is typical when you're doing server-side rendering. One common error is uh, when you have a malformatted table, that this leads to a um, really broken visible DOM. But it's hard to spot, so we're validating the DOM structure there. And you'll see a nice formatted console log output. So it's, it's, it's and again, another thing that helps you, like write cool Preact apps and, um, with Preact X, one of our biggest goals was compatibility with third-party libraries, and we improved a lot there. We it works right out of the out of the box with React Redux, uh, MobX React, style components, and all these other popular libraries. And um, we also published a testing utils library, which is in the main package in Preact. You can import it by Preact slash test utils, and the, it kind of gives you an act function that is similar to React, which um, basically prevents scheduling and turns all schedulers into synchronous renderers so you can easily test your hooks and your rendering process. So with that said, with all the new features, um, we got, ought to do a feature a size comparison. We are known for our size and I'm happy to tell that after having all, after having added all these new features and all the bug fixes we had to make, um, we are proud to say that we are actually the same size. So when you once you upgrade from version eight to version ten, there won't be any size differences. It's just like I think it's in the low range of bytes, like ten or twenty bytes difference. It doesn't really matter. So you're you're good to upgrade because there's no really there's none, there's no difference. And with that said, um, Preact X is hopefully close. We're trying to push out the CLI before we're releasing Preact X. And um, it's it really it's really close because we don't have any blocker issues left. It's just we have two or three issues we have to fix, but apart from that, we're we're basically done. And at this point, Preact X is more stable than eight has ever been. So we are really excited to to see what people will build with it. And we finally want to release this thing. So it should be soon. I'm hoping it's this year, but you never know. So with that said, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, that was the state of Preact. Thank you so much, Marvin. I love your um, your release names. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's always a battle. Like it's, yeah. it takes us it takes us like a half an hour just to find a name. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next up, we have Minko. Minko joins us from the Angular team, and Minko, I'll let you take it away. Hello, you see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. So, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Miko Getchev. I'm working in the Angular team at Google. Today, I want to give you a couple of updates about Angular, what we have been doing over the past a couple of months. Before that, I want to start with two of the biggest, like most important properties that I personally see in Angular right now. So uh, we, our team is committed on maintaining an entire platform right now. We're maintaining a component development kit, which allows you to build customizable and themable widgets on top of Angular. We're maintaining uh, Karma and Protractor to provide testing experience. We're also working on the HTTP module, Universal, and many others. And on top of that, we're testing them across about 1.5 thousand projects in Google. So once we merge a commit on GitHub, we are syncing it internally and running code integration tests of all the projects that we have at Google. And if any of them fails, we can decide how to proceed, whether we want to roll back the change or uh, we want to um, fix, uh, proceed with a fix. So we have two major releases a year. Currently, we're at version 8. And with these two major releases, we're basically following semantic versioning. So we try to introduce, uh, to, to have this contract with developers that we can afford to introduce backwards incompatible changes only twice a year. This way we aim to provide a predictable and guaranteed release schedule and in the same time to open some place for innovation. Because while well, the web platform evolves and unfortunately, and uh, actually fortunately, 
we can evolve with the framework with the web platform itself. So by um, opening this door for some backwards, potentially backwards incompatible changes or deprecations, we uh, help Angular grow together with the web platform itself. And to make the migration process still smooth, uh, we have uh, automated updates capabilities in the Angular CLI. So AG update is not only going to update your dependencies, but it is also going to perform a bunch of transformations or code nodes on top of your code base. For example, in version eight, uh, we perform a code modification that migrates your load children magic string for lazy loaded routes to dynamic imports, which is in a better alignment with the web platform. So I want to, wanted to give some community updates as well, because I recently joined the Angular team about less than a year ago, and I've been involved uh, in the, like with Angular for over five years. I've been active, actively participating in the community by organizing meetups and uh, participating in events, speaking on events. So we currently have 1.5 million active users a month on Angular IO. This was about 50% growth compared to uh, 2017. And uh, we have growth in terms of conferences. So here are some of the events that have been happening uh, annually. Uh, some of them are new, for example, Angular in Depth, Angular NGD, Angular Malaysia, NG Spain. And yeah, I'm really excited about this welcoming and uh, growing community that uh, we're working with. On top of that, we have 790 Angular meetups worldwide. I believe there are a little bit more, but wanted to get the conservative count here. And now let us spend some time talking about the Angular tooling that we uh, worked on over the past six months until the, uh, before the Angular version 8 release. So as part of Angular version 8 in the CLI, we introduced a new builders API that allows to plug your custom functionality, your custom command as part of the CLI so that you can perform a task that uh, is specific for you. For example, ng-deploy is an example of such builder that allows us to deploy applications directly from the Angular CLI to different cloud platforms. We were working also on enabling the defaults in Angular so we can ship you, uh, help you ship fast Angular apps. For example, we introduced differential loading, which is currently running by default. We have component style budgets. We have code budgets for a while. And we also introduced a generator for, for web worker, which generates a web worker and also does some Angular CLI configurations to um, allow you to configure your builds and also uh, make uh, the process of running this web worker smooth in development and production. So for ng deploy, we have been co collaborating very closely with Azure on deployment capabilities for uh, their platform. We have been working with Zeit. Zeit is the company behind Next.js. We're working with Netlify. Actually, this here is a community builder, the Netlify Builder Deploy. And of course, with Google Cloud and Firebase. So you can automatically deploy to these platforms directly from the Angular CLI by adding any of these packages. And after that, running the command ng-deploy. This is going to be available in Angular CLI version 8.3. Another effort that we have been investing in over the past two years is scalable builds. So in Google, we have been using Bazel for over 12 years now. And it has some very interesting and very important features. For example, it has, it, it has um, truly incremental builds and uh, it is framework and actually technology agnostic. So if you have a monorepo with your backend in Java or C++ or Kotlin, and your front end with Angular, you can have truly incremental builds across the entire stack. On top of that, it has a remote build execution and runs your build in parallel. So if you don't have enough CPUs on your machine, Bazel can parallelize your build in default. And since version eight, we did we lose Nika? I can't hear him either. No, I can't. <clears throat> Minka, we lost you. He was just getting excited here. Yeah, especially talking about Basil. He is ready to go on Basil. <clears throat> 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 
Let me text him and see. Yeah. The question is, which one is he looking at? Is he looking at Twitter? Is he looking at text message? Is he looking at Slack? <laughs> oh, the choices. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, looks like he is on Slack. OK, good. <laughs> we got him. He said he's coming back. <laughs> All right. Let's hope that it works. Huh? Hello. Okay. Yes, I'm back. Sorry. Okay, yay! <laughs> oh, so it doesn't let me share my screen now. You're seeing my. I see Basil in version eight. So it was. Okay. Just... Yeah, that's not my screen right now. That's I'm. I don't know what happened, but okay, <laughs> I, I can improvise the rest. So okay. I was saying that uh, with Basil, uh, you you can actually take advantage of uh, Basil in the Angular CLI today by installing the. Bezos schematics. So you can just globally install Angular slash Bezos and from there create a new Angular application, which is going to be using Bezos. And after that, I was going to talk about Ivy, but unfortunately, I cannot share my screen now. Um, and that's not my screen that you're seeing. So uh, the cool thing about uh, the, the, the general news about Ivy is that we're going to, re we're planning currently on releasing it as part of Angular version 9. And we noticed some significant improvements around um, the build time and specifically in running tests. So currently, Angular Material Test Suite takes less than 80%, uh, take, takes uh, only 20% of the time it was taking before. And uh, with Ivy, we're consuming 91% less memory for materials test as well. Uh, we, like most of the Google uh, Google 3, our monorepo um, tests are passing with Ivy. We have over 97% test, test passing, so we are on the long tail or fix, on fixing uh, the rest of them. And uh, yeah, we'll be really excited on enabling more dynamic behavior and uh, metaprogramming with the new rendering of Angular. You can actually take advantage of Ivy today in your application you can you can enable ivy for your existing application by editing your config.json and adding enable ivy property which equals to true under the angular compiler options or you can create a new angular application which enabled ivy by specifying the enable ivy flag you can find like all the information about that on angular io i'm going to share a link in a little bit that was it. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks so much, Mika. Uh, I'm glad we got you back. I was wondering which channel I could ping you on to tell you that. <laughs> yeah, like my internet service provider kind of decided to kick me out, I guess. <laughs> no worries. OK, next up we have Michael. And Michael is going to give us a state of node. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Hi, thanks. Here, I'll just share my screen. Yep. And then just FYI, there's a, let's see. Um, uh, make a few questions in the in the chat uh, that you might want to answer as well. <clears throat> okay, so I'll start on the uh, update on Node.js. I'm Michael Dawson, uh, one of the active Node.js collaborators, currently acting as the technical steering committee chair and the Node.js board representative rep board representative to the OpenJS Foundation, which I'll talk about later on in the talk. Um, the Node.js project is now part of. If you want to follow me on Twitter or reach out to me on uh, GitHub or LinkedIn, those are my contacts as well. So I'll start out with a quick update on releases. So uh, we are coming up to the next LTS release, which will be Node12.x uh, starting in October 2019. As a reminder, we do recommend the LTS releases for production. Uh, 
the, the, the oldest of the LTS releases, 8.x, uh, goes end of life in December 2019. That's actually a little bit of a difference from our regular uh, support strategy, which is 30 months. It normally would have gone end of life in April 2020, uh, but we had to shorten that uh, because of the end of life of OpenSSL 1.2. So that's just a reminder if anybody's still using 8.x, they really should be looking at moving up to 10.x or planning for a move up to 12, you know, after October. Our, our ongoing releases includes 10.x, which, uh, you know, as per our regular schedule ends in 2021. So still quite a lot of time on that one if you've already moved up. We also have the current release, which, uh, which we have every six months. Uh, the current release is 12. That's the one that's going to be promoted in, in October. And at the same time, we'll create a new current release for the, the latest changes uh, in 13.x in October at the same time. One thing on the release schedule that if you're interested in the, the sort of active and maintenance support split, we, we in that 30 months of support, the first 18 months is active maintenance where we backport a fair number of the changes from current. Um, and then maintenance, maintenance where it's more, more high, profile, high, high importance fixes, uh, fixes you know, that we were seeing the community ask for, or security um, type fixes. Um, and we are currently talking about switching those so that it would be 12 and 18 versus 18 and 12. So if you have some feedback on that, that would be uh, something we'd really be interested in getting some feedback on. Looking at the new features that are coming in 12.x, well, you can you can try out a, a number of these already, obviously in the current, and, and um, but I'll just highlight them. So V8, new versions of V8, which we we get in in every release. I said 7.5, but I think we've already actually landed the the PR to update it to 7.6, or will be soon, um, and that brings with uh, better support for async stack traces, as well as of a number of performance improvements around you know cases where you have mismatched arguments, um, if you're using a weight and with JavaScript parsing itself. It also comes with a number of diagnostic improvements, uh, version 12. Uh, we have a new diagnostic report, which is experimental, but doesn't require a flag. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And it's also easier to generate heap dumps. Uh, you don't need to install an external module that that capability is now built into the runtime itself. There's also, also uh, other performance improvements beyond what we get in V8. We had, there was quite a bit of work that was put into faster startup. Um, so there's a significantly faster startup. Uh, we have worker threads, which is again experimental, but doesn't require a flag, uh, which let you, you know, if you have a case where you, you, you need to use more threads to, um, you know, utilize the, the processors that you may have available on your machine, um, you, it's another option that gives you some different trade-offs versus, you know, using separate processes and a load balancer or using the, uh, the processes functionality that's already built in. There's also a change to automatically configure heap limits uh, in terms of you know looking at uh, what your your memory size is within you know a container or in your native machine, and you know automatically configuring the heap to to sort of reflect what we think fits that. Uh, TLS 1.3 is another new major feature that comes with 12.x on the security front. Um, on the modules front, we continue to make progress. There was a new version of the IS-6 module support. Um, and you know, like, there's a continued push to get that. It's, it's an experimental, but working to try and get that out of experimental. We also continue to work on NEPI and adoption for native modules. And then there are a bunch of general, sort of more general changes like a switch to the LLHTP parser, as well as some new compiler and platform minimum. So as operating systems and, and uh, Compilers go end of line, we move those up, and that means that you may have to upgrade if you're using some of the old ones. If you want to read more in detail, there's a link there that I've got, which you can go and read the, the announcement when it uh, went, became the current, and it gives a good rundown of a, lot, a lot, large number of these changes. There's also a whole bunch of other work going on in the project, so features in progress. Uh, you know, Python 2 goes out of, out of support end of this year, so there's a bunch of work to add support for Python 3. Um, there's work on new streams, a new streams API. We've had a couple of revisions, but you know nobody is, is quite happy with those. So there's work on something something new to, to replace and make those better. There's work on Quick, which is kind of the follow-on to HTTP2. Um, does uh, communication over UDP, and you know it's probably one of the components that will go into HTTP3. So there's work already on that. As I mentioned, there's there's workers. 
there's node report and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on those yes six modules there's some work looking at uh, core promise api so there's been some experimentation and there was some additional discussion and sort of energy around that at the latest collaborator summit uh, a little while ago so i expect that we'll see more work on that front and you know ace work on async hooks is, is still underway in terms of providing better apis for instrumentation and monitoring Workers, uh, you know, workers, this is one of the, the features I'm excited about. Um, it's based on web workers. It gives you the ability to start up new threads. Each thread is its own uh, JavaScript environment. Um, so you're not sharing the full heap, but you do have a number of interesting ways to, to share um, data. It's basically done through, through messaging and you can either have, you know, basically get a copy of, of the data that you pass it can be handed off so that you know you basically transfer the object from one heap to the other, or you can manage your own sharing through shared shared array buffers and atomics. More difficult, but again, you know maybe you can get some different performance um, out of out of doing that. Um, can't you still can't transfer handles? Uh, so that's one limitation, and you know it still takes time to spin up these threads. So it's and threads, threads are workers. So it's it's important to you know look at using pooling. Um, Reusing and, and using pool, reusing those workers and using pooling is, is still recommended. This just shows a, a you know a, a quick example of starting two threads. It's written in a way that you might be um, familiar with if you were using like a fork and exec. You don't have to do it this way. You can actually uh, you know have two completely different scripts. But you know if you're familiar with uh, starting processes in this way, this this may may look familiar. Node report, or actually now just called report, it was a module, an external module, but you know it's something that we felt was important to have in core, so that if you're trying to diagnose problems, you don't have to install new modules, and in particular new modules that may require compilers and compilation, which diagnostic, uh, diagnostic report did. Um, so this allows you to, to generate easily generate a um, uh, a human readable um, report. It's it's in JSON, so it can still be parsed. Um, but you can configure it to, um, you know, basically generate reports on certain events like on caught exceptions or particular signals, um, or you can do it programmatically as well. So that's one of the things that, that's new in terms of helping you to do diagnostics and problem investigation. This is an example where, you know, you can uh, basically just say throw new error test and if you've enabled the diagnostic report on cut exception you'll get a, a diagnostic report which you can, you can look at. I don't have time to go into the details but um, if we share this presentation that the links there. And as always I want to reinforce that you know it's not all, all about features. Lots of feature work as I've shown in the last few slides um, but we have a whole bunch of works uh, you know teams working groups and strategic initiatives um, you know from tooling uh, mentoring to help people get into the project, user feedback to try and get more feedback from our end users, build automation. So if you have an interest in any one of these areas, you know, we really look forward to having you join us, helping us, you know, work on the key initiatives to help, you know, build out our safety net, grow our involvement, leverage better information, make, you know, good choices, supporting in, our end users and just making all of our lives in the project easier through automation, things like that. I did want to mention the package maintenance uh, initiative. Um, that's an initiative where we're, you know, we've we've gotten a number of interested people together in terms of trying to figure out what we can do to help um, on the ecosystem front. Where you know we often have packages which are very important to Node and are used by lots and lots of applications, um, but there's challenges in terms of keeping them well maintained, up to date, um, and you know we're trying to figure out how we can help package maintainers. Um, and, and, and also help businesses understand and, and be motivated to help those packages because they understand their reliance on them. One of the first things we've been working on is this support metadata. And the idea is to you know, try and provide more information so that you know, businesses using packages can understand what they're using, hopefully be motivated to help those packages, as well as to let the package maintainers set an expectation so that you know, if you're relying on a package, you understand that, you know, the support is best effort and you shouldn't expect quick turnarounds and so forth. And so we're looking at, uh, you know, potentially adding to a package.json or a separate file, um, some information, which would include like the target, which is like which versions the maintainer plans to support of node, uh, response in terms of like how quickly the maintainer plans or chooses or is able to be able to respond to issues, 
is there a paid option? You know, if you're a business and want to pay to have maintenance, um, you know, can you get that and how quickly will the, the, the people you, you pay respond? And then finally, you know, information about backing. So is, is this project something that, you know, I'm doing in my own time as a hobby or is it something that's got a company, a foundation or whatever behind? So that's something that, you know, we're, we're quite, I'm quite interested in. And, and, you know, certainly we're looking for feedback on this information, the values that we're, you know, options that we're providing. And so, you know, if you're interested at all, I'd, I'd really suggest you go look at that issue and comment in there. And just last to, to close out, I, I wouldn't want to close out without mentioning that, you know, Node is now part of the OpenJS Foundation. I think in the last update we announced or we we mentioned that, you know, that we were exploring merging the Node.js and the JavaScript foundations. That's happened. Um, the CPC, which is the Cross Project Council, that's basically the technical committee, which, um, you know, oversees the work uh, of the projects. Although overseas is, is more of a, isn't quite right because each of the projects is very independent. Um, but it, 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 you know, looks at things that are span the projects. So things like which new projects will be admitted into the foundation. Um, what can we do in terms of infrastructure to support all the projects and so forth. Um, the membership has three levels. They're voting, regular and observers. Um, observers are, you know, people who are free to show up to any meeting and participate. And so if you have an interest in what's going on there, please show up and, and you're very welcome. Regular members have, have made more of a longer term commitment to be involved um, and are generally, you know, the requirement is that they're part of one of the, the projects that's part of the foundation. And then finally, voting members are, are there just to sort of vote, make the final votes if we can't come to consensus uh, in the overall membership, because it's, it's really a very consensus seeking type approach. Uh, you know, some of the key things have been worked through are the project progression, which is the process that's going to be followed to um, bring on new projects and other working groups and teams are starting to form. So, for example, one on standards, we think that's an area where the, the OpenJS Foundation can certainly per, play a role is in is helping to work and represent, uh, you know, a good number of projects in the standards organizations, because it's often hard for one smaller project um, to do that on their own. Um, so, and as I say, you know, so what's next, you know, it's really what you make it. So please meet us in GitHub and help, uh, help us improve Node and, and the OpenJS Foundation as it moves forward. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, yeah, the Node, Node project, I remember when I first started getting involved, uh, I think it's been almost two years now. I was like, oh my gosh, there is so much. You know, you look at other projects and you have a core team maybe. And that's basically it. I think Ember has done a really good job at kind of separating out uh, into different uh, initiatives as well. But with Node, there's, you know, there's no way you can't not get involved because they have so many different things, user feedback, mentorship. Uh, you know. So just dive in, like Michael said, you know, there's no better time than now. <laughs> I cannot. Is he saying it is easy or not? Is it easy or not? It is. It is pretty easy to do. So you would just need to comment on um, some different things, and you can always ping Michael on GitHub as well yeah. or on Twitter. Um, and I'm sure he's happy to help you get started. Uh, myself as well. Yeah, there's there's lots of different areas that you know. My recommendation is always to look at the team and working group meetings. There's a there's a schedule if you go to Node.js slash calendar, and the meetings are basically open. They're all streamed on YouTube, so you can watch. But they're generally also open for people to just show up and participate. So look for one that matches. You know, if you're if you're interested in hardware and infrastructure, look at the build working group. If you're interested in you know the, the user feedback, there's that. There's the core project, there's lots of strategic issues. So look for one of the things that kind of matches your interest and, you know, start watching and getting involved on that front. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, and last but not least, I'm so excited about all the stuff the Ionic team has been doing with Stencil. So very, very excited to have Manu joining us for this. Uh, Manu, we're ready for you to blow us away with the state of Stencil. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, <laughs> I, got, I hope I don't get disconnected from this one. <laughs> okay, let me see my screen. Um, can everyone see it? Yep, we're good. Yeah, so um, today I'm uh, representing the Ionic team and uh, more specifically the Stencil Core team. 
And I think we have a really cool set of uh, new updates and features. So let's get uh, started. Um, Estensil is pretty much a set of uh, tools for building reusable and scalable design systems. And we want to do it based in um, future-proof uh, web standards. So um, when we build Ionic 4, um, we already went through several refactors. And, and in this one, we try to build something on top of future-proof technology. And we think that uh, web components was the right way to go. But there was many uh, open issues and uh, other problems to solve. Because, um, well, uh, we have to target all of them. And while web, web components are just HTML components, the developer experience is not uh, perfect, right? So Stencil, you know, when we generate a collection of components and, and our users, or not our users, but anyone using Stencil, um, you can consume this uh, in an idiomatic way in each framework. So for example, in this case for Angular, you will just import an ng module called Ionic mo uh, module, and they just use it. Or if you are saying about React or Preact, um, we have the Ionic React, um, package and then you will just import the, the components just like that. It will just feel like a native, like a, you know, it will feel like a home for, for React developers. Um, you will get all the type and support, everything you, you will expect. And same with Vue. So um, uh, also if you have, you don't use any framework at all, you will just, um, you know, have the two, two of the script stacks in an empty index HTML and they will just work. And some of the interesting things here is that uh, we we have the thing that is called differential building, right? And for example, in the in the first script, uh, that one actually uses modern JavaScript. We try to rely as much as possible in what the browser can do today. So that one uses native in sync await. It uses uh, native uh, dynamic imports for the lazy loading and, and native, uh, you know, just ESM. Um, so all of that, we can, we can really do it because we have, um, in the way the components are defined in Stencil, it's a declarative way. So with all that information, we can update bindings for these uh, frameworks. We can up, uh, output a single dependency-free uh, JavaScript file that can run in Node, and, and it works for server-side rendering, or documentation, or uh, lazy loading, or just raw web components. So for example, for the docs, uh, you can just have an output target and we, you know, we can generate a readme or just a JSON file with everything. Uh, so one very cool thing that we just uh, released, um, I think last, last two months or last month, I'm really bad with timing, uh, we released Stencil 1. And that's a consolidation of the API. Uh, we built Stencil for our use case, but we found that a lot of companies and a lot of uh, actually big companies building this components that actually really have to be reusable across many different themes. Um, so it was a big effort to, you know, make something that not just work for us, but for everyone. Uh, a new compiler architecture that allows us to have even more inter interesting output targets and also work too hard uh, to, make a, to make a stencil server dependencies. So for example, when you update, um, you have a starter of a stencil um, there is just two folders in the node modules. And this is not only great for developer experience, in my opinion, because, well, you have the create stencil app, and it just takes uh, eight milliseconds. Uh, but also because uh, it feels a lot of more future proof to us to be able to know um, much better what the actual JavaScript that is running in, in your application. So this is kind of a strategic thing for us. Uh, then also we improve the runtime compiler. So for example, for the to-do MVC, it's just 2.4 kilobytes, which is uh, sometimes even smaller than um, some Hello World examples. And this is possible because of some of the PV systems we have um, and our focus in trying to rely a lot in what the browser can do today. So um, yeah, this is actually really interesting. Um, so, you know, previously I said that the web, the components are uh, declared um, in a declarative way, but also the way that components reference each other is really different uh, compared to um, other frameworks. So the references between components are really are weak, completely weak. Um, they don't, you don't actually import one component uh, to use them. 
within the stencil project. This allows us to uh, make each component a different file. We could pretty much uh, lazy load per component, right? This is, well, this is a really interesting idea um, in practice in that way, right? Because we have late, uh, network latency and we have other problems. So a stencil can actually perform a static analysis of how the component depend on each other and we can bundle them together uh, much better in, in better bundles. And while I, have to, I don't have time to really explain uh, what's a new algorithm that we have in Stencil One, uh, there's a lot of slices. And in order to really make sense of it, I will take too much time. Um, yeah, I really encourage you uh, to check my talk in DSCOM. Otherwise, this is too much for, for this uh, you know, five minutes I have, more or less. Um, then we can also generate module preload. Um, also, this is important because of the nature of how a stencil generates something. It will generate a lot of files. So we can uh, analyze what is going to be the critical path um, at such a point, like we, this can actually work with pre-rendering. And we can actually generate the module preload for all the JavaScript assets that are part of the critical path. And this is 100% uh, done by, by a stencil. So um, looking forward, what are we doing uh, today and in the future? Uh, we have a big interest in CSS modules, um, not the ones that uh, I don't, the ones using React, but they actually spec uh, that allows to to import the CSS directly directly from ESM imports. Uh, we think that that aligns um, of uh, how to import these components and how to re how to, how to import this CSS and reuse them across different components. So we're really looking into that. Um, now of the projects we have is web workers, um, but we, we are trying to think of a different way to, to include the web workers within the stencil. So one um, of the designs of the stencil is that all the public API of a component is asynchronous. So when you expose a public method of the component built with the stencil is not going to return a number or, or nothing. It's just going to always going to return a promise. This is important because that's how we can implement transparent lazy logging. You can actually create a component and you can call a method of this component before that component is actually being downloaded. So under that idea, we think and we are excited to, to start moving parts of the Ionicle logic into web workers and do and be able to do that without any kind of uh, breaking changes because they are already promises. Um, we are also uh, looking into um, research of different template APIs. Uh, 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 yeah, in the view presentation, uh, it was really good explaining how the VDOM is kind of slow because you have to check pretty much everything is dynamic. So we're looking into different uh, different approaches to make this better. Um, we are also uh, having a, a, a strong focus in end-to-end -end design uh, solutions for design systems. And this means that we are not only one to solve the problems of you know, building components, but how big design systems play all together. Um, and I guess this is a different set of problems that not just involve the API of the compiler, but uh, higher level of, of problems. And we want to, to help that really, really, I mean, we have to have a really good product for, for that. Uh, then of course, the developer experience is a, is a, is a must. We, we are looking into the new uh, incremental APIs of uh, TypeScript. I think you are seeing in the next release, uh, 3.6. We want to integrate that, um, better errors. And then finally, uh, this is something I've been waiting for for months is the for participation API. Uh, I think they just zip it in Chrome. Um, it basically allows web components to um, participate in the form submission of data. And this is right now kind of a problem with web components because it doesn't really work. You have to uh, do some hackery and some of the things you will expect from a normal input is pretty much impossible to do with a component, right? Like a, your own range component or something like that. So um, and this is coming and I, it feels like all the major uh, browser vendors are uh, 
okay with it. So I think it's going to be a, um, we want to add first class support for that uh, within the stencil. I think it's a cool feature, it's a really important feature for the test system for components. And if it's a spec, we can be sure that uh, it's going to be feature proof, at least that's the, that's the idea. And yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much, that's, it. that's pretty much it from my side. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. And that is how we have somehow gone through five different updates of, sorry, six different updates of different libraries in just about an hour. So it can be done. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes. <laughs> So, uh, you know, watch out for all these folks on Twitter. I believe everybody uh, here is on Twitter. Um, there are so many opportunities, again, to get involved in open source and just make amazing, uh, make amazing contributions. You know, everybody starts from somewhere. I remember one of my first uh, PRs was uh, changing all the uh, double quotes to single quotes. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, the baby steps. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you so much, panelists, for joining as well. Um, hopefully, these can, conversations continue on Twitter. And I will be posting this recording very soon, too. Other than that, uh, we'll go ahead and log off now. Thanks again. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.